I don't know about you, but my journey, especially in the charismatic world, which I know can be unique, is I have been on this journey. I grew up a charismatic pastor's son. I grew up around miracles and prophecies, the manifestations of the Holy Spirit, demons being cast out of people. I mentioned at last service, I just thought that was normal. Uh, I never met a religious spirit until I went to Bible College Seminary, and I ran into a bunch of people who said they believe in tongues, but they don't speak in tongues. I ran into a lot of people who said that they believed in divine healing, but they never actually operated in it. How many of us know that the religious spirit operates in a form of godliness but denies the power of God? Nothing makes religion more mad than the demonstration of the Holy Spirit in fire. Nothing makes religion more mad than demonstrations of the Holy Spirit in fire. I have seen people so comfortable with the Holy Spirit until demons start manifesting. I have seen people so comfortable with the Holy Spirit until people start talking in tongues. And so growing up in a supernatural environment, you begin to try to navigate what is the will of God for my life and how can the supernatural perhaps uh, accompany my journey to know God and to follow his will. As I started my journey early on, I was drawn to several passages of scripture that I believe could be very helpful to us that might seek to ground us in the word of God versus our experiences. It's really dangerous to base your faith on human experience, which will fail you, where we should actually be basing our faith on the eternal written word of God. Really want to encourage you to get rooted in the word rather than your emotions or rather than allowing your experiences to dictate your beliefs. And so as I began to research and look into the word of God, David uh, began to be a, a, a character that I was drawn toward. And one of the things that God began to reveal to me about David, especially when he was young, is you have Samuel show up on the scene as a prophet of God. I find it very interesting that this might be the only time that Samuel maybe misses it. I know that the word of God says that none of his words fall to the ground. But remember, Samuel goes to Jesse's house. He's seeing all of these men. And David is out in the fields tending to the sheep. And Samuel just thinks, hey, it's one of these good-looking guys. And the Holy Spirit has to say to him, man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. How many of you say amen? amen? I won't even make a joke right there. It's not funny. Sometimes we do the opposite, but I'll leave it at that. So he's anointed. David is anointed by Samuel as king over Israel. How many of you have ever received a powerful prophetic word from God that spoke to your destiny? Raise your hand. Okay. So we can relate in some ways to David, amazing, anointed king over Israel. But what we fail to talk about in the church is the 14-year period that apparently the prophet left out of extreme warfare and wilderness. He, he didn't tell David, you're going to go to seminary of, of a demonized man. You're going to be hunted. You're going to wander around in Engedi. You're going to spend days and months and years trying to find the will of God in the midst of holding on to an incredible word from God. In fact, what I have found in my journey is a sign that the word is actually from God is the warfare that ensues. 
I remember being in a meeting in Pennsylvania. There was a guy sitting on the front row dressed in a suit, a guy sitting in the, the second row that looked homeless. And I get this word of knowledge that the guy that looks homeless is a multimillionaire that God is going to raise up in his city. Talk about man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord searches the heart. Remember prophesying to this individual the great plans that God had for him to finance the city. I get a call a month later, him telling me I'm a false prophet because he lost all his money. You know what my response was because I know the Bible? I said, sir, I'm actually convinced that that word is from God. Because the amount of warfare you just experienced to contest the word of God tells me it's true. Okay, so back to reality. We're living in an American, Western, microwavable, wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. The prophet gave me a word. Where's my house? Where's my car? Where's my upgrade? Click, amen. It's going to manifest overnight. And when it doesn't, they're a false prophet. I just can't imagine what went through David's head. He was probably cursing Samuel. Like, what, what did you do to me? You crowned me king over Israel. And he had to be like, Is there, was, there an, was there another encounter? No, there was 13, 14 years of him wandering around Israel. I want you to follow me. Wandering around Israel, familiarizing himself with the land so that one day when he reigned as king, he would know where the enemy was hiding. Think about the honor that David had for Saul. That even cutting a little piece of his rope, I tell people, I'm totally locked into this, okay? I'm, I know I'm like the Mr. Prophet guy, but there was a word from God that even David had that he could have acted on so that he could have rightfully killed Saul. Oh, here we go. Here's what David learned sometimes about prophecy. Sometimes you get a word of prophecy, not so that you can fulfill it, but just simply so that it can test your heart. What was that about? Who knows? <laughs> so he was anointed king, is Israel, king of Israel, but he was not appointed Till 14 years later. What am I saying? We have to recognize on our journey of faith that there is a difference between anointed versus appointed. There is a period of days, months, and years between the anointed and the appointed, between the word from God and the process that comes to test us to see if we will endure and hold on to the promises of God. I meet people all over the country. We do prophetic trainings. We prophesy. People love to get a word from God. And what I say is I know it's very straight to the point. I'm kind of that way. We become drunk on hearing God at the expense of obeying God. So it's like the word, the Lord puts a seed in your heart of promise. And some people, they even begin to see it manifest a little bit. They begin to taste a little bit of the word. And then all of a sudden, bam, wilderness. And then we spend the next period of days or months wondering what's wrong with us. Wondering why God is punishing us when in fact he's not punishing us he's actually proving us as sons and daughters worthy of inheritance what if the bigger the word of destiny the deeper the call to consecration now, i'm going to tell you the truth okay you can laugh because it's it's okay i like making fun of myself 
When I started reading the Bible on my journey in a charismatic atmosphere of dreams and visions and miracles, and he heals some and he does in others, and people are confused because they had a dream and they thought she was the one, and it was actually a different one the next month and the next month, and people start saying God said and he didn't really. I mean, it can be really honestly quite confusing. I don't know. God's all of a sudden bipolar schizophrenic. But on my journey to try to discover the will of God, I found myself rooting and grounding myself in this whole concept of anointed versus appointed, that God is not mad at me, he's not against me, he's actually for me, but I went from the guy, I used to dress up in bright colors, okay, I would go to prophets meetings, I've even hitchhiked. I hitched height from Florida to Pennsylvania because I wanted to grow in the prophetic. Yes, my parents thought I was nuts, okay? I hitchhiked and I sat on in an airport with a, with a bright sign. This is God's my witness. I've written about it in a book. It said, looking for a ride to the prophets conference. I mean, I was hungry. I wanted God. I wanted a word. I wouldn't recommend this, but a pastor from Illinois ends up picking me up. I stay in the hotel with him. He pays my way. I was a very poor college kid. He pays a whole way, and I have an encounter with God that weekend. But here's the point. I went from bright colored, can't miss me in a crowd to when I started recognizing actual prophetic process, I stopped wanting a word. I stopped dressing up and I began to hide in the back because I knew the moment I got a major word from God was the moment major warfare would set in. People don't preach this because it doesn't sell, by the way, but it's straight up Bible. I want to tell you the truth tonight to help you to process God's will for your life that includes trials and tribulations that are never meant to question God's goodness. He is a good father who has our best interest in mind. He has seen the end from the beginning, and he is way more concerned with our character than how we feel. Old Testament, I'll give you in a New Testament. What about our brother Paul? A lot of people view Paul's life like he murdered Christians, he stood at the grave, the stoning of Stephen. All of a sudden, he has this encounter on a horse He gets knocked off. He's blinded by light. He gets healed, and then he writes the rest of the New Testament. Wrong. If you read Galatians chapter 1, you'll realize that Paul spent a period of three years in the desert of Arabia and doesn't make his way back up to Jerusalem for another 14 How was someone called by God like Paul perhaps go off the grid for 15 years? Where was he? What was he doing? He was being prepared by God in the wilderness, probably showing him how much he had to suffer for the sake of Christ. So out of the New Testament, I like to talk about three C's, calling, commission, excuse me, calling, consecration and commissioning. I believe our problem in much of the church is we believe because I'm called, I'm commissioned. We want to skip the consecration character. We have a generation ready to slay Goliath publicly who has never battled the lion and the bear publicly. We dream about spotlights, and the truth is, if you don't get rid of the skeletons in the closet, the very spotlight you want is going to expose your pornography addiction. Yes. 
So on my journey, and I'm going to begin to share a part of my journey, I wanted to share with you two Old and New Testament realities that really began to ground me. A lot of people, you're going to waste time questioning whether you're called, and it's the wrong question to ask. You need to stop allowing trial and tribulation to call into question whether God called you or not. Or not. Actually, again, the type of trial and tribulation you're going through is proof you're called. I said last service, Jericho was tightly shut up. The fact that Jericho was tightly shut up was proof to the Israelites that the devil was scared that they were about to bring Jericho down and begin to execute a level of destruction on satanic principalities and power. So oftentimes the resistance, oftentimes the challenges, oftentimes whatever comes our way, I want to encourage bold faith in this room. I believe God wants to release supernatural courage and boldness and a deep conviction that God God is good regardless of the circumstances that I face and that God is going to raise up a people who are going to love to de destroy the works of the devil. God is going to raise up a mature company of sons and daughters who on the day of battle, they're not going to shrink back. God is going to release a mature company in America who know that they have the stake. We just have to get it marinated. We just have to, I believe God is going to raise up voices in this nation who he has been preparing in the wilderness. We are about to see the emergence of unknown knowledge unpopular people who have chosen the narrow way, who have been tried by fire, and they're going to be way more reliable in the days of shaking coming than our charismatic heroes.